This is CBC Here and Now. There's very little exposure to the province there, but what the exposure is, is 500 jobs for New Flanders and Labrador. The province invests in the promise of jobs. Good evening, I'm Carolyn Stokes. And I'm Anthony Germain. Right to our top story. Now, two men have been charged with conspiracy to commit murder today. The target? A man who's alleged to have ties to the Hells Angels. Five men are facing charges as police swept up what they believe is a criminal enterprise. Here now's Ryan Cook joins us now. So, Ryan, let's start with the conspiracy charges. Yeah, so a few years back, Brad Summers was said to be trying to set up a Hells Angels affiliate here on the island. And now he's said to be the target of a murder conspiracy. Two men were charged back in May with plotting his death. And then today, two more men face the same charges. 24-year-old Shane Clark is facing conspiracy charges along with trafficking cocaine. 18-year-old Brandon Glasgow is facing the same charges plus weapons offenses, including careless use of a firearm. They joined Dustin Etheridge and John Squires, who were both charged with conspiracy to commit murder back in May. Now, as a result of those first arrests, police began knocking down doors around the St. John's area. They executed several search warrants on houses, businesses, and hotels, and they came up with a haul. We're talking seven kilos of cocaine, $240,000 in cash, and 20 firearms. Okay, so Ryan, what do we know about this group that was brought into court today? Well, five men were brought in today to face new charges, and police are saying that this was the investigation into Dusty Etheridge and Associates. They range in age from 18 to 36, and while some are facing more charges than others, they are all facing charges of trafficking cocaine. And this was a joint effort by police across Atlantic Canada, and they say that more charges can be expected soon. Anthony? Thanks, Ryan. That's here and now's Ryan Cook live in our newsroom. Meanwhile, police are investigating a shooting in Conception Bay South. Neighbors reported hearing shots on Chaders Road at around 11 o'clock at night. Investigators eventually found that the gunfire came from inside a home, and they believe that it was a targeted incident. No one was hurt and nobody has been arrested, but it's certainly rattled the quiet residential street. We heard a loud crash and tires squealing. And we came to the window and looked, and there was um, a truck taken off, screeched up the, the hill there and peeled rubber and left, <laughs> left the scene. Well, St. John's Company is warning the public about a potential rental scam in the city. Crown Property Management says a man posed as a landlord for one of its apartments alleged and allegedly collected thousands of dollars from those prospective tenants to secure the spot. Here now is Jen White has the details. And no, this is a first. Yeah, I've never come across something like this before. Lindsay Kelly has worked with Crown Property Management for the last seven years. She says a woman came into the office two days ago saying that a man had shown her a property, took a damage deposit and the first month's rent and gave her a receipt. She said she was expecting to move in on September 1st, but on Tuesday, the man sent her a message saying the apartment was no longer available. When um, she couldn't get in touch with him again to get try and get the refund of the funds that she'd paid, she went to the property itself and came across our um, painting crew, who then informed her that the property was managed by Crown Property Management, and we put the puzzle pieces together and determined that she had been shown the property by the previous tenant's um, son-in-law. So when the previous tenant put her notice in to vacate, um, during that time before we did the move out inspection and, and changed the locks, he was showing the property. The woman suspected others were in the same situation. So Kelly posted a warning on social media. And since then, four other people have come forward with similar stories. He met all of them at the property, showed them, gave them receipts, even signed a lease with, um, with one of the individuals. Kelly says the people she has spoken with are upset and overwhelmed. All of these people have given their notice at their other apartment. Um, we're expecting to move into this unit for September 1st, and we already have it rented ourselves. Um, and now they, they have nowhere to go, and they're out $1,000 or more. Lindsay Kelly says she's given a statement to police, and now the company is working towards getting new rentals for those people who are left without a place to live. Jen White, CBC News, 
St. John's. Now the Royal Newfoundland Constabulary told CBC News it's looking into whether a complaint has been made about an alleged rental scam. Meanwhile, Crown Property Management has some advice for anyone looking for a place to rent. Lindsay Kelly says you have to be careful who you're renting from. If it's not a property management company, she suggests you ask the landlord for references from previous tenants. Kelly also says while it's common for a landlord to ask for a damage to deposit up front. Don't pay your first month's rent until you move in and the keys to the property are in your hand. It allows us to put a good plan in place and, and uh, hopefully that plan will lead us to the Olympics again in 2022. Tim Guju draws big money from Purolator in its quest for gold. The Liberal government's goal of creating new jobs in this province received a big shot in the arm today. One of North America's leading call centre firms is opening up an operation in St. John's. It comes with the help of government loans and grants, and the job numbers are big. Terry Roberts reports. These are the first of many new employees at SNP Data in St. John's. About 50 people in training so far, a number that's expected to grow to about 500 sometime next year. Hi, Bird and we'll be watching that they have an objective to make their company the most sought after place to work with in the city. The big incentives were revealed today. From the province, a nearly $1 million loan, a quarter million more for training, a COA contributing with a $500,000 loan. There's very little exposure to the province there, but what the exposure is, is 500 jobs for Newfoundlanders and Labradors. Located in this massive space at the Village Shopping Centre, site of a former call centre, the man in charge at SNP says he's committed to a long-term presence in the city. Well, we've never closed a uh, market in our history. Um, I would tell you we are probably the only outsourced provider that can claim that. Employees will be answering calls for service and sales for telecom giant Rogers Communication. Cato says the company has received 800 applications for work since recruiting began last month. We've never seen a response like we had received in St. John's in terms of number of people interested. Workers can earn more than 30,000 annually and there's plenty of opportunity for advancement. Cato is a great example of that. I ended up at uh, S&P Data on the phones. Um, started right at the bottom where everyone else starts and, uh, and here I am. S&P operates nine other call centers throughout North America with a workforce of 3,000. Terry Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. Well, things are in Cornerbrook are calming down now that the mill isn't facing hefty tariffs on newsprint heading for the U.S. The business community is buzzing over yesterday's good news that tariffs have been eliminated. Here and now's Colleen Connors has more. Downtown Cornerbrook, a little more relaxed now that the main industry in town is operating normally. It was a tense time for retailers and people who service or sell to the mill. And you saw it from the mill's employees side too. I'm not buying that couch set till I know I have a job in three months' time, or I'm not buying that new car. So you saw some, they were holding on to their money for good reason. They were protecting their investments, protecting their interests, and they were being conservative in their spending because they just didn't know what was going to happen. Golding says now people are much more comfortable spending their money on that new car or meal at a restaurant. It was a scary time for the 400 Unifor employees that got up and went to work here every day. But now that things have settled and Kruger will be reimbursed for that tax money, one union representative can think of a few ways that money could be well spent. That money should be coming back to Kruger. Uh, so much of it, some, some of the capital projects were planned for this year were maybe postponed or canceled. So, you know, hopefully we'll see some more, get some infrastructure fixed up down there. That's, that's what the place needs down there now. As for the jobs lost, both the Board of Trade and the union do not think any jobs will be replaced. But there is hope for growth with the diversity in the new Asian markets. And with the new Asian market being tapped into more, now they've learned we can't put all of our eggs in the American basket. So now that the Asian market is on tap and they're putting more focus there, there may be an increase in production and, and hiring can start up again. I mean, that would be, I'm sure, everyone's long-term vision is to see more, is to see growth. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Cornerbrook. The city of St. John's is still warning some of its residents about their drinking water and the dangerous levels of manganese in it. About 10,000 homes, most of them in the West End, are affected by this problem, and the city isn't quite sure when the issue will be resolved. 
Here now is Jeremy Eaton, was curious to learn more about manganese, and he went out looking for this science lesson. Chemistry professor Chris Kozak explains why some of the city's water is a little dark. Picture this vial is your water. It's got a little bit of bacteria in it and some iron. The city wants to purify that water, so bring on some potassium permanganate. That kills off the bacteria and oxidizes the iron. Then... So they'll add a little bit of this potassium iodide to it, and the potassium iodide now reacts with the excess permanganate, and that causes the manganese now to precipitate out. So it's the precipitated manganese that has a dark gray or black color, and we think that this is what's actually coming through the pipes. Manganese is a metal, and our bodies need it, just not too much of it. The daily recommended sort of limit of amount of manganese in water is about 0.1 milligram. So a milligram is one one thousandth of a gram, and a gram is about the size of a sugar cube, if we want to consider it that way. So one tenth of one one thousandth of a gram of uh, manganese per liter of water. About 250 streets in the city have been affected. Now, one of them is Leslie Street, the home of the Labatt Brewery. The beer makers found high levels of manganese in yesterday's brew, so it's monitoring the situation there. Labatt says it hopes the issues don't continue, but that the safety of the consumer is its top priority. The good news for weekend beer lovers is that your favorite Labatt products will be on shelves for a while to come, and all that beer is safe to drink. Now, the city of St. John's is reminding residents affected by this issue to keep an eye on the coloration of their water and, if needed, to take advantage of their multiple fill-up stations until the city can come up with some solution to this problem. Jeremy Eaton, CBC News, St. John's. Well, it's jaw-dropping video, a man clinging to the hood of a car as it speeds down a Toronto highway. It's a stunning example of how quickly confrontations can escalate to near deadly. Greg Ross has that story. It was like a scene straight out of a movie. You could hear the engine revving underneath and uh, we were passing the other traffic, which were probably doing 90 to 100. Just before 10 o'clock Wednesday morning on a busy Toronto highway, Dave Yeomans was clinging to the hood of a car traveling at speeds of around 100 kilometers per hour. So what's going through your mind then? Uh, how long before he comes to his senses? Uh, Yeoman says it all started when he refused to allow another driver to merge in front of him. He says the other driver became incensed and started shouting profanities. He stop checks you and that's how he uh, gets yeah. you to stop? So, so he did it about four times. The two vehicles eventually came to a complete stop in a live lane of traffic. Yeoman says the other driver got out of his car and walked right up to his window. Well, he reached in the back window and pulled out a toolbox and threw it in, in the, uh, the lane. That's when Yeoman says he got out of his car to take a picture of the other man's license plate. Then he sped towards me, so before I got my phone out, so when he was coming towards me, I just jumped on the hood so I wouldn't get hit. And the next thing you know, you're going for a ride. Yeah. It kind of made me think of when you're watching a movie and you see some guy doing a stunt. Daniel Yang captured this video on his dash cam. Talk about what goes through your mind when you look over and you see a guy on the hood of a car traveling at that rate of speed. Uh, I was uh, first of all, it's a it's a shock thing. So there's shock value there, and then and then the like it just for me it was just more of a safety thing. Think about how quickly that this could have turned into a fatality. Ontario Provincial Police Sergeant Kerry Schmidt says they have arrested the man behind the wheel of that car. 42-year-old Edward Ennis is charged with dangerous driving and assault with a weapon, referring to his car. Having a person on the hood of your vehicle and you're going down the highway at highway speed is nothing short of the most extreme type of aggressive driving I've ever seen. Said I think about all the other cars on the road and I think about how much danger you would have been in had you fallen off the hood of that car. That would have been bad. Yeoman says he was on the hood of that car for about a half of a kilometer. And he just stopped and let you off? No, he stopped like really abrupt, uh, I guess trying to slide me off the hood. So I slid off the side so I wouldn't get run over again. Yeoman somehow walked away from this ordeal with no injuries. Greg Ross, CBC News, Toronto. Now, if you're heading out of town this long weekend, you are going to pay more to fill up at the pumps. Gas is up almost three cents a liter. On the Avalon, self-serve will cost you just over $1.37 a liter. Diesel also up by more than three cents, as are furnace and stove oil. There's no change in the price of propane.
And that means it'll be a little more expensive if you end up circling Rollins Cross in confusion. The notorious intersection in downtown St. John's is now a big traffic circle. The pilot project started early this morning. Council will vote on whether or not to keep it in the spring, but in the meantime, there's a new flow with no traffic or crosswalk lights. Driving instructor Jim Brazel says it's less intimidating, a less intimidating setup for drivers unfamiliar with the area, but locals are taking a minute to adjust. But I'm seeing, I think, an awful lot of drivers who are used to the old Valens Cross coming up and stopping at lights that aren't there. I see them going through crosswalks when people are standing there waiting to go through. But I think with a little bit of time, a little bit of, of uh, experience, the, the ones who have been driving this every single day will get familiar, will get comfortable with it. Tim Guju has a new sponsorship in the lead up to the 2022 Winter Olympics. The reigning Briar champions will have a four year partnership with Purelater while they work towards qualifying for the next Winter Games in Beijing. Purelater will fund the team's expenses and travel. That's something that Guju says will boost the team's goal to win another Olympic medal. Very, very excited. Uh, you know, these partnerships go a long way in, in our success and uh, it's real expensive for us to compete and, and to train at the level that we do and, and to have the support of Purelater for the next four years. It allows us to put a good plan in place and, and uh, hopefully that plan will lead us to the Olympics again in 2022. I want to take a different approach to politics. I want to be collaborative, respectful, build partnerships, ensure that there is accountability and transparency. Meet the newly minted NDP nominee for Windsor Lake. That's coming up.
Well, I went out today. It was still gorgeous, at least here in St. John's, but noticeably cooler. Oh, yes. Yeah. Still pleasant. Yeah, it was a ni quite mm -hmm. a nice day, but yes, the air does have a little bit more of a Christmas crispness to it. Christmas will come. <laughs> yeah, let's not even go there. <laughs> let's not even yeah. think about that. Uh, let's have a look at our highs okay. for today. Yeah, it got up to about 17 degrees in St. John's. Central area is looking at about 14 or 15 degrees today. So yes, much cooler than we've been used to for sure. And those cool temperatures are going to be sticking around. Right now, we do have some showers working their way across the island on their way to uh, the Buren Peninsula and to the Avalon Peninsula. So St. John's should start to see some of those heavier showers at around 10 or 11 o'clock tonight, as well as the Buren Peninsula there. So that should start to clear off though tomorrow afternoon for the rest of the province. Some scattered showers early tonight in Lab West and for the Happy Valley Goose Bay area and later for the southeastern portion of uh, Labrador. But we're looking at a, a Amounts of about 5 to 10 millimeters in the east. St. John's overnight going down to 17 degrees. So it's going to be fairly warm overnight tonight. Uh, and a chance of th some thunder showers for Marystown and for St. John's. So overnight lows looking pretty mild. For Labrador, though, very different story. Uh, most of Labrador looking at a risk of frost overnight tonight. Overnight low in Lab City, 1 degree so very very cool so the mild temperatures overnight tonight though are definitely going to be changing tomorrow as the wind direction changes so tomorrow morning in st john's it should be around 17 degrees could see some lingering uh, showers earlier in the morning but things are going to start to cool down temperatures in the low to mid teens to start the day for the rest of the island and cooler in a labrador so yeah tomorrow morning some cloudy skies, some scattered showers for central areas. Labrador clears off very nicely throughout the day. For St. John's, as I mentioned, it's going to start off fairly warm with a chance of showers, but then the wind starts to change. So by the afternoon, we're looking at mainly cloudy skies, winds westerly gusting to 50, 14 degrees. So the temperatures are definitely dropping. And then we move into a northerly wind uh, in the evening, uh, gusts up to 60. So tomorrow evening is going to be cool and it's going to be pretty breezy. So the high for St. John's tomorrow around 15 degrees with a mostly cloudy day for central areas, 13 degrees with a chance of uh, some scattered showers throughout the day for the Gander area and for the West Coast, a bit warmer along the, uh, the coast there. Uh, Cornerbrook looking at 19 degrees with a mix of sun and cloud up along the straits. Chance of some shower action there as well. Temperatures in the mid teens and for the rest of Labrador sun right across the board and temperatures staying in the mid teens as well. So I thought we'd have a quick look at the long weekend. What everyone is waiting for, right? And things are looking pretty good so far. It's definitely not a scorcher, but you can see just sun and cloud for Saturday, Sunday and Monday for the entire island. Cooler in the east on Saturday, 14 degrees for St. John's. So yeah, a little bit chilly there, but uh, Labrador also looking great. Happy Valley Goose Bay and uh, the southeastern portion of Labrador could see a few showers on uh, Sunday, but overall things are looking fantastic. I'll have more details a bit later, Anthony. Thanks, Carolyn. The newest candidate in the Windsor Lake by-election hit the campaign trail today. Carrie Claire Neal won the NDP nomination on Tuesday night, and she was out on her first day of door knocking today. And here now is Kate McGilvery was along for the ride. Carrie Claire Neal's never done this before, but she's got some seasoned help. NDP leader Jerry Rogers is along to show her the ropes. Of course, a lot of people are concerned about the high cost of electricity with Muskrat Falls. So, and you want to tell them a little bit about yourself, Carrie, what you've been doing? Uh, definitely creating a sustainable economy for our long term is something that I'm really passionate about. And uh, Thrust into the race on Tuesday, too. Neil's playing some political catch-up. Her opponents are Chess Crosby for the Progressive Conservatives and Paul Antle for the Liberals. When we look at Chess and Paul, it's hard to see much of a difference between them, except maybe they're wearing different colored ties. I I can offer a young, fresh voice in our House of Assembly and a, a new perspective. Neil is young. She's 26 years old and still finishing her master's. But she says that in this race, that's going to be an advantage. She's making youth issues a part of her campaign. People want to see themselves represented on the ballot. 
and young people have issues that are not being addressed. There is incredible youth out migration, we have a high unemployment rate, and young people are worried about their future in this province. And so as a young person, I think it's really important that I have a, a seat in the t at the table. Neil says she draws inspiration from the most recent St. John City Council race, when young people ran and won. In this Airport Heights neighborhood, she tried to get that enthusiasm across. I'm seeing a lot of my friends move away. That's yeah. a real concern. People aren't finding jobs. They're oh, worried no. about the cost Should of living. Yeah, exactly. Right. Talking to constituents is just one part of the journey. Headquarters are still being set up, and her pamphlets won't be ready until tonight. That leaves less than a month till Windsor Lake votes on September 20th. Kate McGilvery, CBC News, St. John's. Well, this is my mess. I live here with uh, 12 other guys. I should say, like, 12 of my best friends, just because we're stuck here all the time. Leaving friends and family behind to take this warship out to sea. Ahead, all aboard the HMCS Charlottetown.
Operation Nanook is wrapping up, so HMCS Charlottetown is heading south. And from the top of the bridge to the bowels of the engine room, keeping the ship floating, fighting, and fed, well, that all falls to Newfoundlanders. And here now is Peter Cowan, spent five days on board chatting with many of them. So, Peter, what did these people have to tell you? Anthony, I saw firsthand that the Navy is very different from any sort of other job. It's a lifestyle and one that includes plenty of sacrifice. Wakey, wakey, and some breakfast. Testing journal alert, Mike Boy Relief Alert. It takes 240 people all working together to keep a warship at peak efficiency. But when they're at sea, every sailor leaves their friends and family behind for months at a time. Janice Locum thinks a lot about her 14 and 6 year old daughters. I was just away for Mother's Day. That, that kind of hurt a little. Birthdays, Christmas, my husband was just gone at Christmas time, so. She's a bosun, heaving lines, launching boats, and dealing with the ship's massive anchor. Her husband understands he's also in the Navy. He was on this ship earlier this year. Now he's on shore while she's at sea. Parenting alone all the time might seem tough, but she makes it work. That's what I like about the military. You have that camaraderie ship, whether at sea or at home. So my friends at home that I sail with or in the military, they're like your brothers, sisters. So you always have that help with you. So this is my mess. I live here with uh, 12 other guys. I should say like 12 of my best friends, just because we're stuck here all the time. That camaraderie comes from some close quarters. This warship wasn't built for comfort and personal space is at a premium. Dylan French doesn't mind. When he graduated from high school in Gander four years ago, he didn't want the student debt that came with college or university. The people he works with are the same ones he eats with and relaxes with. The only place on board that's truly yours is your bunk, and it's not much. Yeah, so I usually get in like this, pop a little squat, roll on in. It's not as uh, closed in or as uncomfortable as some people think. It's actually pretty good. I put my phone right here, some Velcro, and watch a movie, hang out, kind of get some alone time. Yeah. How important is it to have some time away from the people you spend all day working with? If you can isolate yourself for a little bit, you kind of gather your thoughts. I think about like uh, my dog and my girlfriend in here and then I'll go to bed and wake up and just pretty much do the same thing again every day, you know? He spent eight of the last 12 months at sea, but you won't hear him complain. Growing up in Newfoundland, you don't get to do a lot of travel. You're uh, isolated on an island. Flights are expensive. So uh, joining the Navy, I've been all over the globe in the past four years, it's been pretty crazy. Relaxing on board means a friendly game of poker or watching a movie in your downtime. One thing everyone looks forward to is food, and that's Lisa Jean Roberts' job. She lived in Newfoundland for 16 years. She served up meals on army bases, navy ships, and even submarines. A homemade cookie can make or break somebody's day. That's how big it is. Um, you have nowhere to go on here. You have a canteen which sells you some chips and pop, but I mean, you can't live off of that all the time. So sometimes just having a plate of macaroni and cheese or a nice home-cooked steak or a home-cooked uh, roast turkey dinner can uh, lift somebody up and get them out of a funk. While Roberts keeps the sailors fueled up, keeping the ship running is on Jonathan Baldwin's shoulders. He always knew he wanted to be in the Navy. He joined through the officer training program, getting his education at Memorial University. Now he's training to lead the engineering department. I find people are usually quite surprised by the amount of responsibility that is given to a junior officer. Uh, you're, all of a sudden, at you know early 20s, you're responsible for a department of up to 60 people, um, and you have men, women, and uh, people coming to you with very different issues, and you're expected to uh, help guide them through that process. Today, he's down in the engine room, overseeing work on one of the ship's big turbine engines. It's similar to a 747. It's complicated work. Today, they have to clean it. He sold on the Navy as a long-term career, but others on board are already thinking about what they'll do next. Hopefully become an occupational therapist. That's it. Oh, yeah. Okay. So I'm so, starting all new. <laughs> the Navy life is great. I've seen places I never thought I'd go to. I've been to places I didn't know existed. But uh, I think when it comes time for me to settle down and have a family, I'll probably pick another career path. Uh, what that might be, it's going to take a bit of time to decide. Well, it's a fascinating lifestyle, Peter, and you got to spend time on board, you lucky devil. What was it like? Well, I slept in the same cramped quarters that we saw there in that item. Mm -hmm. And just to prove, here is how inelegantly I got in and out of bed. 
I did have a chance to do a few other tasks on board as well. Course 263, sir. So, for example, I got to steer the ship which is actually just taking the commands from the skipper. So then I got to actually be the one to give the orders, which is rather fun when you have a yeah. ship that you can make turn on a dime. So or you got to have your hand on the wheel. I absolutely. Accelerate up to 55 kilometers an hour. All right. Wasn't just the bridge, though. Uh, everyone on board the ship is actually a trained firefighter in case of emergency because okay. you all need to pitch in. So I put on the gear and made my way through a smoky corridor and got to man the hoses as well. All right, manning the hoses, who doesn't dream of that? Uh, what about weapons? Yes, I got to fire one of those Stuff. too. Mm -hmm. The uh, C7 rifle, which is the same weapon they use on boarding parties or to okay. defend the ship. Right. I was told I was a good enough shot in order to at least pass basic training. So. Okay, so you found your inner Rambo. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Probably the hardest thing I did, though, was just getting on and off the ship. I wanted to get some shots right. of HMCS Charlottetown at sea. You can't do that while you're on board. Nope. So I had to climb down this very rickety rope ladder mm -hmm. in order to get into one of the small boats. And uh, of course, just as I was about to reach the boat, a wave came along and uh, bumped me in. Okay. They caught me on the first bounce though. Uh, and so got to actually go out and get some shots from the water. Right, okay, so it's kind of like a bouncy castle for you, but did you actually get the shots? It was so wavy, I just had to hang on while I was out there. So I've got a lot of shots of the floor of the boat and right. sea spray coming at me. Uh, but uh, yeah, I didn't even get the shot in the end. All right, well, after having all little dreams come true for a lot of men who get to go on a warship, any thoughts of joining the Navy? Anthony, I'd miss you guys here, here now too yes, much. Yes, no doubt, no doubt. And we would miss you too, Peter. Peter, thank you very much. My pleasure. Yeah. Ooh, there it is. A local artist helps dress up the new and improved departure lounge at the St. John's Airport. She takes us on a tour coming up. Welcome back to Here and Now. Nunatsiavut's uh, government, government's Minister of Culture calls one of her publications the Bible. Carol Bryce Bennett did early research on land claims. Her best known work helped Labrador Inuit go into negotiations with governments and establish Nunatsiavut. She passed away in Montreal this week, but she's being remembered for her research contributions. As far as I'm concerned, just save the Inuit from where they were heading. Now they're, they're, they can govern themselves and 
make their own decisions. That wasn't possible before. Where do you think you'd be without her? Same place we were back in the 60s and 50s and whatever. Getting relocated and shipped around. and uh, I think it made a huge difference. People have voice up here now. Former MHA and Cabinet Minister Tom Murphy has died. He was the Liberal MHA for the former district of St. John's South from 1989 to 1996. And during that time, he served as a Cabinet Minister in Clyde Wells' government. Murphy was also a well-known athlete who played baseball, hockey, and football. He also rode in the regatta. Murphy was 81. He died on Wednesday after a short illness. Well, if you've flown in or out of St. John's recently, it's hard to miss the airport's major makeover. The new departure lounge has been dressed up thanks to three massive art installations. Mm -hmm. And one of them shows a view of the city from above, while the other two dive deep and depict sea life. St. John's artist Vesela Baraklova was selected from a slew of artists to create the works, and Vesela met up with the CBC's Zach Gowdy to show him around. Hey, Vesela. So as we enter the new departure lounge, we're going to see the first of your artworks? Yeah. Ooh, there it is. Okay, well, that's uh, the, the map of St. John's Harbor, and as we can zoom in, we can find a few hidden treasures. And so as you get to the top of the escalator, here's the second of these pieces, hey? Well, this is what it was uh, the main idea of um, um, bringing the visitors to a moment of wonderment. Uh, something that you come and pause for a second and be taken by the vastness, the largeness, the boldness of the color and the animals. And so now we come to the third and final work? Yeah. Wow. That somehow uh, it's uh, a part two of the same series. And the idea was to continue the illusion of your being under the water. And if the first part, it's showing uh, the creature who are to be seen more in the top part of the a surface, this one explore uh, in a, some grand way uh, the creature who could be found more in the bottom of the... I just wanted to reinforce the message, the important message that our place is very unique and I know that sounds like banal because most of the places said that but look at our uh, uh, place of origin. We are island. We are surrounded by water. Uh, water is what constitutes uh, the place to exist. I think uh, my work is going to be justified if the people pause for a second and think, well, this is a mass of uh, water that surrounds us. And those are the creatures we have to be very um, uh, appreciative of and we have to take great care of that ocean of ours. I think my purpose of the work has been achieved. Driving down that highway when you come across that Goose River Bridge and you can see the runs for the hill uh, grown over somewhat, mind you, but you can see the runs and you can see the ski hill. You think to yourself, what a shame that that ski hill is not open, up and running. I'll tell you about the local church that's trying to bring Snow Goose Mountain back into operation coming up on Here and Now.
Well, a lot of people might come down with the mysterious <coughs> illnesses to make the long weekend even, <laughs> even longer. longer. <laughs> people already planning the, the big weekend. So. If that's going to be you, then you just called yourself no, no, out. No, no, no. I have no alibi now. It's true. Yeah. No, I'll be here. Okay. Well, uh, yeah. It's in heading into the weekend. Things are looking fairly cool, but it's looking like a nice weekend. Mm. I'm really looking forward to it. We're going to start with a look at uh, the temperatures right now in the province. 14 degrees in St. John's right now. 17 in Stephenville. McCovic sitting at 18 at 18 at 8 degrees uh, right now. So tonight we do have some showers uh, working across the island brought lots of rain to the west and to central areas to Gander today and this evening it's going to be the Buren and the Avalon that will uh, see the bulk of that about five to ten millimeters uh, for Buren and the Avalon tonight and a risk of thunder showers but then things clear off nicely for Labrador and tomorrow some scattered showers on the northern peninsula there and for parts of central a mainly cloudy day for St. John's tomorrow we have that gusty northerly wind keeping things pretty Pretty cool 15 degrees in St. John's as the high tomorrow chance of showers for Grand Falls Windsor tomorrow and for St. Anthony temperatures in the mid teens but a bit of a nicer warmer day uh, on the west coast for Labrador sunshine across the board looking at 15 degrees in Lab City 13 along the coast so yeah Friday night into Saturday you can see very clear skies for pretty much everyone but we do have those cold winds those cold winds keeping things very cool uh, for the St. John's area, the Avalon Peninsula. So Saturday right now is looking to be about 14 degrees, but central areas and the west looking at about 20 and uh, eastern Labrador looking like a great day. Sun and cloud and 24 degrees on Saturday. So uh, Saturday night into Sunday, we're looking at some showers for southeastern parts of Labrador, but the island still looking pretty good. A mix of sun and cloud for pretty much everyone warming up a bit in the east. 22 degrees for the rest of the island, 24 for eastern Labrador with that chance of showers and uh, sun and cloud for the west and 16 degrees as the high. So just look at this uh, five day forecast. It's sun and cloud right across the board there. So while things do cool down in the east on Saturday, we're getting back to some nicer temperatures as we uh, enter the work week once again after the long weekend. Similar story for central areas, sun and cloud uh, right through until Tuesday and temperatures in the 20s as we get into next week. And as well for western uh, Newfoundland, things are looking pretty warm. Some cooler overnight lows though, but a mix of sun and cloud right through until Tuesday. Chance of showers for Eastern Labrador on Sunday, but then things clear off for uh, Monday and Tuesday. And for Western Labrador, sun and cloud, sun and cloud, sun and cloud is the name of the game and temperatures a little bit cooler there. 17 degrees on Monday and Tuesday. Anthony, that's your forecast. A Carol's forecast for the Big Land might not be ski temperatures just yet, but a new Baptist church in Happy Valley Goose Bay inherited a ski resort and now parishioners and volunteers are working extra hard to try to get that operation running by this winter. Here now is Jacob Barker paid a visit to the Old Snow Goose Ski Hill. This is faith in action, restoring the Old Snow Goose Ski Resort, the prayer to get one slope open by winter. We're looking forward to getting it open by Christmas. We just need a little bit of cooperation from uh, some inspectors and, uh, and the black flies. The property was donated to Baptist pastor Darren Dinsmore He's been in town for the past couple of years, setting up the new congregation. I mean, oftentimes you read in the Bible about the hill of the Lord and uh, Mount Zion and, you know, all sorts of different analogies that could be used. And uh, it's great. I mean, just being out in nature, God's creation. We are putting in uh, some new foundation pieces for the top of this rope lift that runs. Brian Davis is overseeing the not-for-profit that has been formed by the church to get the ski hill operational. He and some eager volunteers still have a lot of work to do. There's a lot of pieces that have to come together. I mean, it's not a, just as simple as turning on the lift, uh, grooming the snow and inviting people out. The hill stash of rental equipment is also in need of some work. We've got uh, a small company, Adventure Sports Marine, that's going to uh, be revitalizing some of the old ski equipment and uh, renting that out and taking care of some of the administration. The ski hill hasn't operated since the early 2000s. Exciting for the town, Davis says, and a dose of nostalgia. 
driving down that highway when you come across that Goose River Bridge and you can see the runs for the hill uh, grown over somewhat mind you but you can see the runs and you can see the ski hill and immediately all those memories come flooding back and you think to yourself what a shame that that ski hill is not open up and running. Well, the goal is to have this beginner run open for the season to prove the viability of the project. If that goes well Davis and Dinsmore say the sky is the limit for what Snow Goose Mountain could become. Jacob Barker, CBC News, Happy Valley Goose Bay. Canada Post is in the final hours of negotiations with its biggest union to resolve a long-standing pay equity dispute. For more than a decade, the union says rural and suburban mail carriers have been paid less than their urban colleagues, and gender has been a factor in that difference. Olivia Stevanovich reports. The Canadian Union of Postal Workers maintains rural and suburban mail carriers who are mostly female earn at least 25% less than their urban colleagues who are mostly male. Urban workers make an hourly rate. Rural and suburban workers' pay is based on the number of deliveries they make and how far they have to travel. Me and all the RSMCs, we feel like we're second-class citizens there. We're kind of the leftovers of Canada Post. In June, an arbitrator found both types of employees did the same job but don't receive the same kind of compensation and set a deadline to come up with an agreement on pay. It's been a long struggle and hopefully we'll achieve justice. In anticipation of a settlement, Canada Post has built a $242 million loss into its latest quarterly results to cover costs, although that number could be revised depending on the final outcome. Women workers and rural women in this particular case basically have been subsidizing Canada Post's profits for decades. Um, and it's a question of fundamental fairness. Canada Post declined an interview request, but in an email statement sent to CBC News, interim president and CEO Jessica McDonald says the corporation is committed to resolving the issue of pay equity for rural and suburban mail carriers as quickly as possible and calls pay disparity on the basis of gender wholly unacceptable. The two sides have until midnight Eastern to reach an agreement. If they don't, an arbitrator is prepared to impose a final outcome on the case. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Regina. At least one suspect is still at large after an RCMP officer was shot and seriously injured last night in a cottage community in Manitoba. The RCMP is truly a large family. And what has unfolded over the last few hours truly affects every officer and employee from coast to coast. The 42-year-old officer is in stable but serious condition following the shooting. It happened an hour north of Brandon. Around 9 p.m. yesterday, two constables were called to the scene of a robbery where they were fired on almost immediately. Three men are now in custody, but the search continues for a fourth and for a stolen vehicle that was involved in the incident. The future of the Trans Mountain Pipeline is once again in doubt. The Federal Court of Appeal has overruled the government's approval of plans to expand the pipeline, and Indigenous leaders who joined the legal challenge are cheering. It's a proud moment for us as Indigenous people across the country, across the land. Little nations came together and created victory. Meanwhile, Kinder Morgan Canada shareholders voted today to approve the sale of the Trans Mountain Pipeline to the federal government for $4.5 billion. The sale was already announced, but after that court ruling, shareholders held a special meeting to give final approval. A six-year legal battle by a group of veterans over military disability pensions is over. The Supreme Court of Canada has dismissed a bid to hear an appeal from the group, which calls the current compensation scheme inadequate. One of the complainants is a soldier who lost both legs to an improvised explosive device in Afghanistan in 2008. And he says he wouldn't want his own children to sign up for military service. Unfortunately, we find out today that there is no justice in Canada for, for our new generation of disabled veterans. Quite frankly, to find out that you have less coverage than you would have under workers' compensation if you're injured in uniform is no basis for potentially sacrificing life and or limb in the service of Canada. The complaint dates back to the Conservative government decision giving soldiers disabled after 2006 
a lump sum payment and income support rather than lifetime pensions. Liberals have since restored a pension for life option and pumped a further $10 billion into additional support measures. But some veterans want the pre-2006 option fully restored, arguing it is the social duty of the government and all Canadians to do so. Here's today's viewer photo of the day. Just love the reflection of the sky and the water. Sweet. Isn't that nice? Oh, this is a toughie, Carolyn. Yeah, there's really nothing here. <laughs> no clues as to where this was uh, taken, but I'll have the answer after the break. Welcome back. Well, if you thought that you spotted a raccoon in the east end of St. John's earlier this month, no, the heat was not playing tricks on you, making you see things. No, that's right. Uh, conservation officers confirm a raccoon was caught earlier this month, but not right away. No, there's photographic evidence. He was on the lam for two weeks until somebody spotted him in a tree in the Airport Heights neighborhood of St. John's. Fisheries and land resources say they capture one to two raccoons on the Avalon each year. Most uh, of them come in on freight uh, shipments and uh, because they're not native to Newfoundland, the raccoons sadly cannot be kept in captivity. So this guy had to be mm. euthanized. Yeah, it's not a happy ending. No. <sighs> Poor thing. But what do you do? Yeah, I know. Yeah. All right. Happier thing. <laughs> Let's look at our viewer nice picture of the day. <laughs> Terrible segue. <laughs> <laughs> But this is a lovely photo, yes. isn't it? Uh, yeah, this was taken on the Avalon Peninsula in a rather famously named place, Dildo. Beautiful spot. Yes, gorgeous. So thank you very much, uh, Tara, Wise, and Jarrett for sending this in. And if you have a photo to send in, you can uh, email it to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Beautiful reflection there. It is just gorgeous. And we can end on a happy note because I don't see a raccoon in any of the trees nope. there. So, <laughs> no uh, animals being euthanized we're okay. here. <laughs> I love the blues, though. <laughs> Anyhow. So, yes, right. please send us in your photos. And we have a moment. I should make one note because we get a lot of photos sent in where people hold their phone vertically. Right. If you can send in a photo, hold your phone horizontally because it, it's easier with the screen. I can't get okay. a, a horizontal photo. So. so you want to held this way? This way. That way. Yes. There you go. Yeah. Tomorrow, <laughs> how to paint the landscapes. <laughs> Karen will be here. <laughs> Please send them in. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining I'll see you us. Tomorrow. Have Friday a great tomorrow. Night. Friday. Yeah, see yeah. you then.